We're very pleased to be uh, able to speak to you all tonight about one of my favorite subjects, and that, of course, is uh, Montana's Constitution. Um, I'm sorry I can't be there with you personally, but uh, as I mentioned before the sound cut out, we've had a little bit too much of our clean and healthful environment uh, here in Helena, so I didn't want to uh, risk driving through all of that. Uh, before I, I uh, talk to you about the Constitution, and I'll kind of give you a brief outline of what I'm going to talk about, uh, I wanted you to all be aware that a new statewide organization in support of Montana's Constitution has been created. It's a nonprofit 501c3 whose honorary co chairs are former governors Ted Schwinden, Mark Roscoe, Brian Schweitzer, and Steve Bullock along with former Senator Ambassador Max Baucus. I know you and your democracy committee will be working with them in the weeks, months, and years ahead. Good organization. So what I wanna to talk to you about tonight, uh, mainly three things about the Constitution. I wanted to give you a little bit of a brief history of the Constitution. And uh, how it came to be, and uh, we're talking about the state constitution and uh, how that came to be. Uh, I want to talk to you about some of the challenges that our constitution is facing, and I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, forming a vision of how your constitution can work for you. So let's start with the history part. Uh, State constitutions, of course, were part of the American experiment and, in fact, predated the 1776 federal constitution. Uh, the Federal Bill of Rights was modeled by uh, James Madison from the Virginia Constitution, as a matter of fact. Uh, and in the 1900s uh, and thereabouts, uh, when people started looking at their state constitutions, they found that they were too long and too detailed, and that they combine basic principles with policy prescriptions and proscriptions. No place uh, in fundamental or organic law of the state. The Constitution is not supposed to be a code book or a cookbook, but they were. Uh, and why is that so? Because uh, detailed state constitutions uh, deprive the government of flexibility, changing conditions of society, deprives uh, state uh, of ability of uh, its constitution to be a living document. So as a result, the people looked to the federal constitution, which was not encumbered with those restraints, and state constitutions did not adequately protect uh, the rights of citizens. In the 1970s, uh, state constitutions were sort of rediscovered. Keep in mind what was going on in the, in the 70s, the Vietnam War, liberalism of the 60s, the exponential growth and reach of the jurisprudence of the progressive Warren Court, and the appointment of a more conservative Burger Court by Nixon. Uh, in turning their attentions to state, state constitution, state judges, scholars, and attorneys found unexpected rich, richness in those constitutions. Rights parallel to the federal constitution were protected, but more importantly, rights not protected in the federal constitution were often protected in state constitutions, such as privacy, gender equality, and education and housing. A legal point that's fundamental to constitutional law that we'll touch base on uh, later in my remarks is that State constitutions can provide greater protections and more rights uh, than the federal constitutions, but not less. That's a very important uh, principle of constitutional law. In the 1960s and 1970s, 38 states, Montana included, took a critical look at their own state constitutions. And some, maybe a dozen, uh, again, including Montana, amended or adopted new constitutions. 
Against that backdrop, Montanans took a seriously serious look at their former constitution, which was primarily the 1889 uh, territorial constitution, which reflected the territorial and early statehood period in Montana's history. Starting in the late 60s and early 70s, the legislature and various citizens groups moved towards amending or rewriting the 1889 constitution to provide a more active and dynamic government. These efforts culminated in a referendum uh, in 1971 and the election in which voters approved to call a constitutional convention. Pursuant to the enabling legislation, Montanans elected uh, 100 delegates to a constitutional convention in November of 1971. And those delegates consisted of 58 Democrats, 36 Republicans, and six independents, uh, 24 lawyers, 41 professionals, 13 education, educators, 20 farmers and ranchers. Interestingly and importantly, members of the legislature were prohibited from serving as delegates. That was as a result of the Montana Supreme Court decision, which uh, held that uh, sitting members of the legislature could not hold uh, two offices at the same time. So because no politicians were delegates, delegates did not bring partisan acrimony and bitterness, but were less political and more able to approach issues objectively. So we had 14 ordinary citizens. Another important factor was that delegates were not seated by party, or by gender or by anything except by alphabet. Delegates were seated alphabetically uh, and the sort of a, a special interest affiliation broke out because people were seated alphabetically. This was a master stroke of the president of the convention, Leo Grayville Jr. And he had some interesting remarks when he opened the convention. And I quote those, we must be open open to ideas, to opinions, to debate. We must also be open to our own conscience and our inner selves. We must seek guidance and good fellowship right here in this room. We must be responsive to each other. If we can make government work here, then perhaps we can help Montana move into the future with confidence and vision. Another great source uh, of uh, constitutional history, and I'm obviously not going to be able to go through those, is the constitutional transcripts, uh, which consist of 2,300 pages of debates, speeches, uh, and you can find those in the state law library and in bound volumes and on CDs. So let's look for just a minute at our state constitution. I want to just briefly talk to you a little bit about its organization. But the first thing I want to mention to you is the preamble to the Constitution. And this is probably, at least in my view, one of the most beautiful pieces of prose written in any public document ever conceived in the state. And I quote, we the people of Montana, grateful to God for the quiet beauty of our state, the grandeur of our mountains, vastness of our rolling plains and desiring to improve the quality of life, equality of opportunity, and to secure the blessings of liberty for this and future generations to ordain and establish this constitution. So the constitution from its preamble forward was grounded in Montana's unique environment, its beauty as a state, its mountains, rolling plains, uh, and in the quality of opportunity that, that the framers of the Constitution wanted people to have and uh, to enable them to secure the blessings, not only for the people of the 1970s, but for that and for future generations, the generation that we're living in now and that we're being able to take advantage of this wonderful constitutional document. So the organization of our constitution is not unlike the federal constitution and 
most state constitution, it provides for uh, the three branches of government, the legislative, executive, and judicial branches, which incidentally, uh, contrary to what you might uh, see in the papers and coming from our, our legislative branch, these are branches are co-equal co -equal to each other. Uh, they're bound by a separation of powers. And the whole purpose of the three branches and the separation of powers is to provide a system of checks and balances, one branch checking, balancing the other branches. Our constitution, uh, unlike many constitutions, provides for referendum and citizen and citizens initiative. Uh, it provides for the important functions of government, including uh, revenue and finance, the environment, natural resources, education and public lands, local governments, departments and institutions, and some general provisions and procedures for constitutional revision, which we'll talk about a little bit more about later. Importantly, our constitution, unlike the federal constitution, sets forth the Declaration of Rights, Montana's Bill of Rights, they consist 34 in number. Those are set forth uh, as Article Two of the Constitution. Article One talks about uh, the right of the people to govern themselves and to be sovereign, and all power of government deprived or deriving from the people. But then, right behind that is Article Two, the Bill of Rights, called the Declaration of Rights, and that provides for uh, many of the rights that the, well provides for all of the rights I'm going to talk about tonight and uh, many that I'm not going to be able to talk about because of uh, time. I want to, to impress upon you uh, that our Montanan, our Montana Constitution is a gift. It's a gift from uh, ordinary citizens in the 1970s who were prescient in the provisions that they wrote into our constitution. It's a unique living and progressive document. It protects and guarantees rights not guaranteed or protected in the federal constitution. And our constitution is the fundamental and organic law of the state of Montana. Wanted to mention a couple of other things in that regard. Uh, and I, I mentioned the federal constitution, although I'm not going to talk much about it. Uh, but I want to make clear that to be sure, uh, both our federal and state constitutions are critically important. Both do essentially the same things, setting up the branches of government and the, the administrative uh, matters that I mentioned. But uh, they're, they're different in some fundamental ways. Uh, I want to leave, want you to leave here tonight knowing that our Montana Constitution is not just a historical document, but that it is a living document as well. And by that, I mean it's a working document whose principles adapt to the times and technologies. Uh, vastly different uh, from uh, those that existed when it was written in 1972. Uh, in the Armstrong opinion that uh, we may talk a little bit more about more tonight, the Montana Supreme Court said this about our Montana Constitution. Montana's Constitution, and especially its Declaration of Rights, is not simply a cookbook disconnected and discrete rules written with the vitality of an automobile insurance policy. Rather, our constitution, and in particular its declaration of rights, encompasses a cohesive set of principles carefully drafted and committed to the abstract ideal of just government. It is a compact of overlapping and redundant rights and guarantees. And uh, I, I think we'll uh, see that in, in some of my remarks uh, uh, later. 
our constitution also is not just a defensive document. And we think of it that way sometimes. And it's trotted out when someone's right is violated. It's not just a document telling our state public officials what they can and cannot do. But just as important, in fact, more important, it is what I would call an offensive document, meaning that it is to be used as a template for adjudicating and legislating better governance and a stronger democracy. But our constitution is under attack uh, and uh, it's under attack by, I, I hate to even say it, but I call them authoritarian reactionaries in the legislature and this is serious. It's serious like a fire in the engine. If it's not extinguished, and we're not going to have a constitution left. Uh, I want to give you a few examples of how our constitution could work for us and uh, why it's so important that we not lose these uh, constitutional rights. They obviously cannot go through all 34 provisions of Montana's constitution, but I am going to go through a few that I consider particularly important. Uh, and uh, I want to discuss those with you now. Let's begin with a challenge that I suggest is one of the most important we will ever face. Homo sapiens are the first species ever to have evolved to the point of being able to physically change the climate of our planet. We are the first species capable of ending life on Earth as we know it. Our very existence is causing our global climate to warm unnaturally, is causing the ice in our polar regions to melt and our seas to rise, and is causing mass extinctions of other plant and animal species on an unprecedented and unnatural scale. We are producing like a plague of locusts, devouring our planet's resources and polluting its environments. In a mere 30 years from now, there will likely be 2.5 billion more humans on this planet competing for the same air, the same water, the same food resources and living space that the present 7 billion humans are. And the planet's climate will likely have risen on an average of two plus degrees Celsius. The science supporting these facts is unassailable. The deniers be damned. We are headed for an unimaginable train wreck of a global proportion. Indeed, scientists maintain that we are living in a new geologic age called the Anthropocene, described as the period commencing with the Industrial Revolution and following, during which human activity has been the dominant influence on climate and the environment. As prescient as the framers were in 1787, when the federal constitution was written, and in 1972, when Montana's was written, they did not, and in all fairness, could not possibly have foreseen what our species would do to the earth. Not only in the following two centuries under the federal constitution, but in the mere 50 years, 50 years since Montana's constitution was adopted. Indeed, they could not have foreseen that more than half of the carbon uploaded into the atmosphere a human activity would occur within the last three decades. Think of that, the last 30 years. That means that in one, just one generation, we humans have done as much damage to our planet's ability to sustain life than has occurred in all the millennia that came before. The extra heat we spew out largely from burning fossil fuels, which we trap in the atmosphere near our planet's surface, is the equivalent to the heat from the detonation of 400,000 Hiroshima-sized atomic bombs every day, every day. That's one every four seconds. I suggest that saving our planet from us 
will be the greatest challenge in the next 50 years. The United Nations Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change has endorsed the idea that to avert catastrophic climate change, there needs, needs to be a global mobil, mobilization of effort and technology on the scale of World War II now. But what does the climate change have to do with the Montana Constitution and how can we make our Constitution face that challenge and, and uh, work, uh, work for us? Well, let me, some let me posit some thoughts and I wanna start uh, with what can be done federally. And this is probably the only time I'm gonna really discuss the federal Constitution at all. But I would ask you to start by considering the 14th, 14th Amendment to the Federal Constitution, which is, of course, part of the Bill of Rights. It was adopted after the Civil War, basically to protect the rights of former slaves. It has, however, been very broadly interpreted by the United States Supreme Court in a number of different contexts. Among other things, the 14th Amendment prohibits states from depriving persons of life, liberty, and property without due process of law. To date, this due process clause has been applied as a restraint or limitation on government power or state action. But why shouldn't our courts interpret this clause against government inaction? An interpretation that would impose an affirmative duty on government to take steps to ensure that we are not deprived of life, liberty, or property as the result of climate change. Inaction in the face of a national and global crisis. And why shouldn't that interpretation serve as a template for congressional legislative action and court decisions? It is certain that the effects of climate change will adversely impact our lives, liberty, and property. No doubt many people will be deprived, be deprived of these cherished rights outright as our coastal cities and regions are inundated, as our agricultural food baskets are flooded or turned to deserts, as part of our nation, uh, parts of our nation are otherwise rendered uninhabitable, and as our economy and job markets are damaged. Arguably, while well, government uh, action may not be able to prevent these in the near term, responsible governance, global leadership, and our good example may mitigate these impending harms so that governments throughout the world will begin to substantively, substantively address climate change for the long term. So here's my proposal. If the, if the Supreme Court can broadly interpret the federal constitution, to create rights, and they have. They've created all the rights that corporations uh, possess right now. They're not covered in the federal constitution. They were all created by the US Supreme Court from whole cloth over the 200 years that uh, the constitution has existed. So why couldn't and why shouldn't the court broadly interpret the constitution so as to protect the lives, liberty, and property of us, actual human beings, from the government's failure unwillingness and refusal to aggressively address the effects of climate change to the extent reasonably possible. Aren't we human beings entitled to have our government do what it can do, not only in our nation, but also by leadership and example throughout the world to protect us from a climatological disaster that is more serious than any threat of world war or other nat natural man-made caused disaster that we've ever faced in the past. If our government fails to act, why shouldn't we be able to assert a claim against the government that our lives, our liberties, and our property are being injured? Why shouldn't the court issue an injunction commanding the Congress and the executive to act on our behalf and require our citizens to be compensated for their injuries if the government fails to respons responsibly act? That's not the law now, obviously, but it could be. And in my vision, at least, it should be. This is one thing that our federal constitution can do for us. More to that point, 
our Montana Constitution already contemplates just such a remedy. In our Constitution's Declaration of Rights, Article 2, Section 3, Montanans are guaranteed the inalienable right to a clean and healthful environment, in addition to the inalienable rights to pursue life's basic necessities, to acquire and possess and protect property, and to seek safety, health, and happiness in all lawful ways. Inalienable means that these rights cannot be taken away or denied. And the uh, right to a clean and healthful environment is one of these inalienable rights. So would you not agree with me that climate change infringes on all of these rights, especially to the right of clean and healthful environment? We are a people guaranteed these rights textually in our Montana Constitution. They are fundamental rights. And more to that point, our Constitution addresses these uh, rights in another section of the Constitution, at Article 11. And uh, at Section 1, uh, I'll just read it to you. It's, it's powerful. The state, meaning the state government, and each person, meaning us, each of us individually, the state and each person shall, mandatory, shall maintain and improve a clean and healthful environment in Montana for present and future generations. The legislature shall provide for the administration and enforcement of this duty. The legislature shall provide adequate remedies for the protection of the environment, life support system for degradation, and provide adequate remedies to prevent unreasonable depletion and degradation of our natural resources. And I don't mean to be sarcastic here, but uh, for those of you who have lived in Montana for any length of time, when have you ever seen the legislature uh, protect, maintain, and provide for a better environment? It hasn't happened. It should happen. And if we're to address climate change, it must happen. A few years ago, the Montana Supreme Court rejected the opportunity to provide or to entertain an action grounded in the right to a clean and healthful environment in dealing with, if my memory is correct, air pollution. However, there is another lawsuit presently pending in Lewis and Clark County that is grounded in this right and filed by various people, young people, older people, disabled people, people of all genders, people of all sexual orientations, uh, and all of these people uh, who are those most affected by climate change in the coming years. We should all be following closely this cause of action, which is called Held versus State, H-E-L-D, uh, as it possesses through the district court. It's in uh, Judge uh, Kathy Seeley's uh, district court here in uh, Helena. And then uh, probably, most probably, onto the Montana Supreme Court. Moreover, I suggest that knowing what we know about the juggernaut of climate change that is upon us, it is time that our legislature and our courts consider laws and decisions that will give real voice, real voice and meaning to our Article Three, Section, uh, Article Two, Section Three rights and to the mandatory uh, obligations upon the state and each of us uh, that are set forth in Article 9. Climate change is the absolute antithesis of these rights. Vigorously enforcing our Article 3, or Article 2, Section 3, and Article 9 rights in concert with our right to a clean and healthful environment is something that our Montana Constitution can do for us. And every one of us, should be demanding of this of our executive, legislative, and judicial offices. Now let me shift my focus uh, to another constitutional right. I'm not going to go into this one in quite as much detail because I know that uh, many of you, most of you probably are more than familiar with this. And this is the right of women to obtain pre-viability pre abortion services. 
Interestingly, in the early 1970s and 60s, in the 1960s and early 70s, uh, the United States, uh, among other developed countries, had developed uh, what's called the medical model uh, for um, abortion services. And that basically was that uh, women were free to seek abortion services uh, in consultation with their health care provider. And uh, the decision was made between the woman and the health care provider, dep depending upon the women's need for abortion services, medical, emotional, and mental. Uh, but early in the 1970s, even before Road versus Wade was handed down in 1972, abortion uh, became politicized. And that uh, happened when uh, the Nixon campaign uh, during the Richard Nixon's reelection determined that, excuse me, he might not win, that the best way to garner the additional votes of Roman Catholics who were, are, who were and are, of course, uh, very much opposed to abortion and to uh, white evangelicals, uh, that the best way to garner those votes was to, instead of uh, maintaining the medical model for abortion services, uh, but rather to adopt the Catholic Church's sanctity of life model, which was, of course, based upon uh, religious uh, and sectarian doctrine. So the right of women to obtain reproductive freedom turned from being a medical issue and it became instead uh, a religiously focused uh, political issue, not about, not about fight about persons or personhood, but rather an ideological struggle for partisan-driven uh, power by white males over women's bodies. Uh, You'll have to excuse me, I'm filming through pages here. My, uh, not by way of excuse, but uh, aside from my being unable to drive down it to Billings because of the roads conditions, uh, my computer crashed yesterday. And so I had to kind of piece my remarks here uh, from, together from different sources. Anyway, uh, this too was the state uh, of affairs in Montana in the 1990s when healthcare providers sued seeking a determination that Montana's then existing anti-abortion laws violated women's constitutional right to abortion services. Recall in my opening uh, remarks, I noted that it is a well settled principle of constitutional law that while a state may not provide less protection of a federal constitutional right, it may provide greater protection under its own constitution. Roe versus Wade, which is the federal, was the federal uh, right to abortion services, was grounded in the federal constitutional rights of equal protection and due process of law. However, in Armstrong versus State, which is the Montana version of Roe versus Wade, if you will, uh, in that case, the Montana Supreme Court turned solely to Montana's constitution instead of to the federal constitution and determined that Montana women are guaranteed the fundamental right of individual privacy under Article 2, Section 10 of our constitution and that the right of individual privacy being uh, essential to the well-being of a free, free society and not to be infringed without a compelling state interest provided the protection needed for women's right to pre-viability abortion services in Montana. With this standard in mind, the court carefully considered the history of the right of individual privacy and determined this right, guaranteed that a Montana woman was entitled to make medical judgments affecting her bodily integrity and health and health including obtaining a pre-viability abortion in partnership with her chosen, chosen health care provider, free from government inter interference. Importantly, very important, Armstrong was grounded independently and solely in the right of individual privacy 
and some other fundamental rights protected in Montana's constitution. Armstrong was not decided on the basis of federal constitutional law. And indeed, Montana's constitution provides greater protection of women's right to procreative autonomy, which was the right that we interpreted uh, from the right of individual privacy, uh, which is the right to choose, of course, and does the federal constitution. Thus, regardless of what happens to Roe in the federal courts, Montana women will continue to be guaranteed their constitutional uh, uh, right of individual privacy to seek pre-viability pre abortion services based on the medical model, free from male-driven partisan and religious meddling. Montana's Article 2, Section 10 guarantees Montana women their rights. Now, let me address another very important issue. The right to vote is fundamental to the existence of democracy. Montana's constitution at Article 1, or Article 2, Section 1, provides in the strongest possible terms that all political power is vested and derived from the people. It is founded on their will only. And Article 2, Section 2 provides that it is the people who have the exclusive right of governing themselves. It follows, however, that if we can't vote, we have no political and thus no ability to participate in self-government. The ability to vote is we the people's way of getting our official say about who governs, who leads, and what laws are enacted or repealed. Without a right of suffrage, we have no ability, no power to ensure that our fundamental constitutional rights are protected. Those guarantees that include our rights to life, liberty, and to own property, to a clean and healthful environment, the freedom of religion, and to assemble, to free speech, to free press, to participate in government, to examine public documents, to observe the deliberations uh, of uh, public bodies, to individual privacy, bear arms, to equal protection of the laws, to due process of laws, and to our most fundamental our inviolable right to human dignity. If we can't vote, then our voices will not be heard. These rights will be devoid of any substance or meaning. That's why Montana's Constitution at Article 2, Section 13, protects our fundamental right to vote in the strongest possible terms. This section provides as follows, I quote, right of suffrage. All elections, all elections shall be free and open and no power, no power, civil or military shall at any time interfere to prevent the free exercise of the right of suffrage. The women and men framing our constitution use this extremely clear and explicit language to at one and the same time recognize the importance of our franchise and to protect that fundamental right from being impaired by, among others, government actors. In no uncertain terms, our constitution requires that all, not some, but every election be free and open. That is exempt from external authority, interference or restriction. That no power, civil, that includes members of the legislature, the executive and the judicial branches, no civil power or military, shall at any time, that is before, during, or after an election, never interfere to or prevent, that is to hinder or stop by law or other direct or indirect means or meddling, the free exercise, that is each person's personal right and liberty interest of the right of suffrage, that is our right to vote. The U.S. Supreme Court has left it up to the states to regulate voting. It's the Shelby versus Holder case. This is important because again, while a state cannot provide less protection of a constitutional right, the state can provide more protection of a civil right than does the federal constitution. Thus, even if voter suppression laws may not offend the federal constitution, 
Those same laws will fell, offend Montana's constitution since our constitution provides greater protection of the right of suffrage than does the federal constitution. In the fight to undo partisan voting suppression, Montana law, not federal law controls. I'm not going to talk about it, but I want to give you a heads up. A very important case that's pending before the United States Supreme Court right now, entitled the Harper versus Moore. And it involves a debunked theory uh, that posits that uh, state legislatures are able to determine, and that means to gerrymander federal election districts uh, to do basically whatever they want to do regarding the fixing or gerrymandering of federal elections, uh, even if that prohibits the state constitution, which is absolutely incredible. So I'm not going to talk about it more. Watch for the case. I've written an op-ed out of it that I hope will be published in a paper near you uh, in the next couple of weeks about this that goes into more detail. Very, very important case. Another uh, 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 right I want to mention very briefly is the right to know. Uh, Montana's constitution contains two fundamental rights that are distinct, yet are connected in an important way. The first of these is the right uh, set forth in Article 2, Section 7, uh, titled Freedom of Speech, Expression, and the Press. This provision states that no law shall be passed impairing the freedom of speech or expression. Every person shall be free to speak or publish whatever he will on any subject, being responsible for all abuse of that liberty. It's pretty much the same as the First Amendment. The Second Amendment uh, of these rights is Article 2, Section 9, entitled The Right to Know. And that provides as follows. No person shall be deprived of the right to examine documents or to observe the deliberations of all public bodies or agencies of state government and its subdivisions, except in cases in which the demand of individual privacy clearly exceeds the merits of public disclosure. Here's how the two rights are connected and why they complement each other. Well, theoretically, anyone can avail herself or himself personally of the right to know as a practical matter. Most of us rely on the press, rely on the media, newspapers, television, radio, to cover and report on public meetings, that is the deliberations of public bodies. In short, we the people are able to exercise our right to know because the press is able to exercise its right of speech, expression, and to publish. If either side of this symbiotic relationship is unable to function, then to a great extent, the fundamental rights on both sides are lost. Sadly, that is what's happening. Here are some, uh, some very brief examples to make the point. Open meeting laws have been turned on their heads, uh, especially if the legislature open meeting laws have been utilized to uh, take actions without an official quorum, they're not, thereby not being governed by the open meeting laws. And uh, the business still gets done, but outside the public purview. Exorbitant fees to obtain public documents are charged by agencies. Agencies refuse to provide public documents to the press or branches of government, uh, deny access by the press to public meetings, deliberations, and thus uh, force uh, institutions, the press especially, to engage in costly and time-consuming court challenges to obtain what the right to know guarantees. High-paid agency spokespersons refuse to take phone calls from journalists. And I'm not making the stuff up. I've confirmed it with journalist friends of mine. And as one press person told me, uh, his county commissioners don't talk during commission meetings. They just text each other to prevent the press from hearing their deliberations. All of these practices frustrate the right to know and the right of speech expressed in the press. And all of these deprive we the people 
the fundamental rights that are constantly guaranteed ours to exercise and enjoy, which state actors not constitutionally permitted to deprive, impair, or to legislate away. Uh, finally, uh, and I'm, I'm going to be closing in a few minutes, uh, but I just wanted to uh, mention one other right, which uh, to me is probably the most fundamental and perhaps even the most important right of our Constitution, and that is the inviolable right of human dignity. Uh, it's the only right that is inviolable. That means it can't be violated. That's different than an alien. Violable means there's simply no way to violate. It's incapable of being violated. Human dignity is not protected under the federal constitution, at least textually. But what is that human dignity? I, in a case called Baxter, I wrote a really long special concurrence discussing human dignity, and I'm not going to attempt to uh, plumb the depths of that here, but uh, rather it's a meaning that's uh, pretty much fleshed out on a case-by-case -case basis by the courts. But basically, dignity refused to a worth or a value that flows from an inner source. It is not bestowed from the outside, but rather is intrinsic to the person. To have dignity means that we look at ourselves with self-respect, with some sort of satisfaction. We feel human and not degraded. Dignity is directly violated by degrading or demeaning a person. It is indirectly violated by denying a person the opportunity to direct or control his or, own his or her own life such a way that his or her worth is questioned or dishonored. Indeed, respect for dignity of each individual uh, demands that people have for themselves the moral right and the moral responsibility to confront the most fundamental questions about the meaning and value of their own lives and the intrinsic value of life in general, answering to their own consciences and convictions. Uh, I would uh, suggest that it follows that to make our Constitution work for us, to overcome the challenges against human dignity in this day and age, our courts and our legislature must adjudicate and legislate with this constitutional right of human dignity in mind. Uh, it's simply a template you know, for uh, better, more fair, more equal uh, governance, uh, legislation, and court decisions. We Americans claim to be a God-fearing and religious people. And many claim to be that we're a Christian nation. We're far from that ideal, to be sure. But we would be much closer to that ideal if we simply recognized and honored the innate human dignity of each of our brothers and sisters. So the thing I want to touch upon real quickly now is uh, uh, the real existential threat that our Constitution faces. As most of you probably know by now, uh, the uh, Republican Party has obtained a supermajority of the legislature. They uh, now uh, hold 103 seats out of 150. So they hold two thirds of each house of the legislature. Uh, the ways to amend the constitution, as I mentioned, or I maybe didn't mention, but they're in uh, article uh, uh, 14 of the uh, constitution. And uh, those specifically uh, are as follows. The legislature by two thirds vote, supermajority of all members can place before electors the question of whether there should be an unlimited constitutional convention uh, to revise, alter, or amend the Constitution. Uh, people can, by initiative, do the same thing. The uh, Constitution is submitted to voters every 20 years periodically uh, to vote on whether there should be an unlimited constitutional convention. And the next one of those votes is in 2030. Uh, any member of the legislature can propose a referendum to electors 
to amend the constitution if a supermajority agrees. And people can, <clears throat> can propose constitutional citizens initiatives uh, to do the same thing. However, I would also mention to you that House Bill 651 enacted by the last legislature and signed into law has for all practical purposes made the exercise of the right of citizens initiative uh, nearly impossible. The reason I mentioned these, uh, these important ways that the Constitution can be amended is because uh, if, as I personally expect, and it's, it's my opinion, I don't know this obviously for sure one way or the other, but if the legislature determines by a supermajority to call an unlimited constitutional convention, uh, there are a lot of rights that are going to be on the chopping block. Uh, every, so every legislator up there has got a bone to pick with one constitutional right or another. And uh, I mentioned some of the important rights, um, right to a clean and healthful environment, the duties of the legislature to uh, uh, improve, uh, maintain and protect the environment from deg degradation. Uh, the right of uh, privacy that encompasses a number of privacy rights, but including the right to uh, pre-viability abortion services, the right to know, the right of free press, uh, the right of human dignity, the right to vote. All of those rights are going to be on the chopping block uh, to be rewritten or at least revised or amended in some substantial form. But there's other, uh, but there's other rights uh, that I'll mention uh, 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 too, just just very briefly. Um, I can foresee uh, uh, rights in Article Two, Sections Three, Four, Eight, Nine, Ten, Thirteen, Fifteen, Twenty Four, and Thirty Four being rewritten, revised, amended, or deleted altogether. Uh, Article Five to give the legislature more power, uh, and especially more power over the courts, and especially more power in gerrymandering elections if the independent state legislature theory uh, pans out. Uh, I mentioned Article 9 to uh, uh, the mandatory duties of the legislature to protect and improve the environment. Article 10, which pertains to uh, education and to Native American uh, education, uh, education that's required by the Constitution uh, to have people and our students learn about the uh, cultural, hi cultural history and cultural integrity of our uh, Native American uh, uh, nations uh, in Montana. Um, Article 13, probably to dump the Consumer Council. Um, Article 14, Maybe to dump the requirement for a supermajority. Maybe the legislature doesn't won't need a supermajority if the constitution is written. Uh, so those are some of the some of the uh, uh, items that are going to be on the chopping block if an unlimited constitutional convention is called. And I, I, as a as a constitutional advocate, I urge you that. Uh, urge you that if a constitutional convention referendum is placed on the ballot, vote against it. Um, study the candidates' voting record, women's rights and abortion. Question candidates about their positions on women's rights and abortion and on the environment. Make your voices heard. In public meetings, candidate forms, letters to the editor, guest columns. Fight like hell. Quote the uh, words of our former president. Uh, I want to close with this thought. Uh, democracy is not a spectator sport. Uh, if our constitution uh, is going to uh, protect us and guarantee us the rights that we uh, enjoy, that we have come to take for granted, unfortunately, that we depend upon, uh, then we're going to have to fight for it. Uh, and uh, 
And our, our Constitution simply cannot protect themselves from an authoritarian takeover. Democracy and the maintenance of our constitutions require the active support, protection, and defense of each of us. We cannot formulate our own vision of how the Constitution should work for us, and whether that means that you're focusing on the right to a clean and healthful environment, the right to choose, the right to know. Each of us has a maybe a particular constitutional right that's most important to us and our families. But those are going to be for naught if we cannot preserve our constitution and our democracy. This is a serious matter. As I said, fire is in the engine. Think of which rights you want to lose. In fact, you want to lose any of them. If there is an unlimited constitutional convention, then all of these and a multitude of others will be on the chopping block. As I said, there's a fire in the engine room, and we need all hands on deck to help put it out. Thank you.